Now we've endeavored to look at this from a logical point of view to show how that things upon the earth are not a standard for things in the heavenlies and the th activities in the heavenlies are not that which takes place upon the face of the earth. There is a difference of location, heaven and earth, and there's a difference of activity upon earth and in the heavenlies. Now we've got to keep that straight. Now then, let's observe from the scriptures something with reference to this particular problem and see if we can't uh, uh, come rather uh, than a logical uh, reasoning situation or a logical conclusion. Let's notice that from Revelation. Now I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18. For it is in this particular chapter we begin to be introduced, if you please, to a situation with reference to angelic beings in the Old Testament. You've got to remember, Genesis chapter 6 has its setting in Old Testament revelation and the activities of the sons of God and so forth. And we believe they're angels, as we're going to endeavor to prove here. And uh, uh, Genesis chapter 18 also takes place of course, as you know, in Old Testament, on Old Testament ground. Now, I want you to observe, as far as <coughs> our class is concerned, verse 1 and 2. And the Lord appeared unto him, that's Abraham, in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent in the heat of the day, and a tent door in the heat of the day, and he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye, ha after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant? And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abram haste into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abram ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto his young men. And he haste to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them and he stood by them under the tree and they did eat. Now who are these three? Well in verse um, uh, 1 and 2, particular number 2, we have them called three men. Now these three personalities, they entered into the tent of Abraham and they ate and they rested. Now let's turn over, and you know the ensuing uh, story, how that there was confirmation that Abraham would have a child and so forth, and uh, Sarah laughed. But in verse 22 of this particular chapter, we read this, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom, but Abram stood yet before the Lord. Now there were three, is not right? Two left, one stayed with Abraham. Now then notice, if you will, in the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis with reference to these two men of verse 22 that left and went toward Sodom. All right, in verse 1 of the 19th chapter. And there came two angels to Sodom at Eden. Who are they? Two angels. And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet. And ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did break, bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Who are they? called angels in 19.1, called men in 18.22, as well as 18.2. Now 
Now we're going to prove in the 19th chapter that these personalities are also called men too. Now then, let's continue reading. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the what? Men. Men. Which came in to thee this night. Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. You see, you have this wicked, wicked populace in the city of Sodom. And what are they endeavoring to do? They're endeavoring to have some very godless intercourse uh, with uh, men. And this is part of their great, great uh, problem. And uh, <clears throat> verse 6, uh, we read something of the terrible uh, plight of Lot's heart. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after them and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. But now I have two daughters. Do not break your heart. But now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them mine, as it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now listen. You have, if you please, the populace of Sodom seeing these two angels, and they call them men. You have Lot referring to these two angels as men. Now let's go on before we bring some conclusions. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. See these two angels, men, called men here by the word of the Lord, as well as identified as men, Sodom, Sod the Sodomites, as well as Lot. And notice what they did. Men, if you please, now. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, these two angels, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Two men? <laughs> two angels, right? And Lot went out. And spake unto his sons-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get ye out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this place. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-laws. And when the morning arose, then the angels, the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, and which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men... The angels, the men, laid hold upon their, upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to them, and they brought them forth, and set him without the city. Now that's all we need to read. It suffices us to see that here in the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis, and in the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis, chapter 18 and 19, you have angelic beings from the Lord, angels, who appear on earth. On earth. Now get that class. On earth as men. All the faculties of humanity. They ate, they slept, they talked, and they carried on conduct as men. And even the wicked people of Sodom, who went after all of the various aspects of immoral conduct there in that wicked place, they approached Lot for the services of these two men, two angels that appeared to have faculties, conduct, and everything that is absolutely the same as humanity upon the face of the earth. 
Now that ought to settle some things for us, hadn't it? They're called men. They conducted themselves as men in eating. And, if you please, other men, other men desired to carry on godless conduct with them. Yes, the Old Testament teaches us something that angels had left the glories, had left heaven, if you please, when they came to earth. They did not, in these various portions that we've referred to, Genesis 6 and Genesis 18 and 19, these, if you please, if you please, could and did carry on conduct on the earth compatible with earthly conduct as humanity. Therefore, you see, the little lesson in logic which we just gave a few moments ago, you can't take the conduct of earth, the Lord said, and take it to heaven as being conduct in heaven. Nor can you take the sphere of existence in heaven and bring it to earth, necessarily, and make it heavenly conduct. Unless, of course, it's for particular purposes of God. But when angelic beings did leave the heavenlies and came upon the earth to carry out certain functions, we find in Genesis chapter 6 that they carried on function as humanity, and in Genesis chapter 18 and chapter 19, they carried on functions as humanity also. So I believe, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Old Testament does teach for us that the sons of God in Genesis 6 could be and are, in light of the book of Job, are angelic beings. Because they're called the sons of God in Job, they're called the son of God in Daniel, and if you please, the title refers to angels in those particular references. Now then, let's ask ourselves another question. What does the New Testament have to say with this? After all, if we hold to the truth that the Old Testament will teach us certain activities and certain areas of conduct which are not true for the New Testament, well, what does the New Testament do in light of these events in the Old Testament? Now, there's a great deal of difference between certain areas of the function of God, if you please, in the New Testament with reference to the Old Testament. A great difference. But is it possible that the New Testament, when we come to the new, uh, revelation of the church and so forth, is it possible that this New Testament revelation confirms, if you please, what went on in the Old Testament with reference to this horrible, horrible situation in Genesis chapter 6, which resulted, if you please, in God destroying the whole earth? Well, you take your Bibles, and there are two specific passages of Scripture. And I want you to turn with me in the New Testament. The first passage of Scripture is in the little book of Jude. Jude. That is the book just before the book of the Revelation, the final book of our Bible. Now, I'm going to begin reading with verse 1 of this book of Jude. There are only 25 verses in it, but we're going to deal primarily with two verses concerning the verification or the confirmation the old, in the, uh, of the Old Testament that these beings mentioned in Genesis 6 are angels. But here's a context that I want you to see. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now I give some reasons why we are to earnestly contend for this body of truth. For there are certain men, 
crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And, he says, I want to bring to your attention how God dealt with Israel in the Old Testament. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now you see, there is a great, great thing to remember. Refusal of the grace of God results in judgment. The rebellion against the plan and the program of God results in the display of the holiness of God. And here you have another great example uh, given to us in verse 6 and 7 why today we should contend for the faith once for all delivered unto the saints. And this illustration is an illustration, if you please, which confirms what took place back in Genesis chapter 6. Likewise, if you please, bringing to our attention activities which transpired in Genesis 19, which we used just a few moments ago in the matter of verifying that angels in the Old Testament carried on activity and conduct as humanity. Now verse 6 and 7, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now I want you to watch your Bibles. Because I'm going to take my Greek New Testament, and I am going to try to share with you some of the things from a grammatical point of view, which absolutely are irrefutable when it comes to New Testament Greek grammar. And it's so clear from the original language, and anyone that's taken the uh, course in New Testament Greek, which we offer here or any place else, has to simply come to the conclusion grammatically that this portion is certainly referring to angelic beings and Sodom and Gomorrah are set before us as a like sin of angelic beings. Now you watch your Bibles, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 6. He has kept the angels who did not keep their own principality, their own jobs, you see. That's right, their own jobs. But they left their own habitation. They left their place of dwelling. They left their place of dwelling. Now he, God, has reserved them under the great day of judgment, under darkness in chains. Reserved, everlasting chains. Now here, we're talking about a group of angels. A group of angels that left their heavenly function left their heavenly principality, and they left their heavenly habitation. Now this group of angels that did that, my Bible tells me here in Jude verse 6, that he has reserved them, he has kept them. And oh, listen, let me pause for just a moment and give to you this particular Greek word, tetereken. It is a perfect act the verb. Now a perfect tense looks at this. An act which was done in the past and the results of that act continue to the very present. So these angels that left their heavenly function and left their heavenly home, he reserved them, he kept them back here in the Old Testament under chains of darkness unto the great day of judgment. We'll deal with it in just a little bit, uh, little bit uh, uh, later. Elaborate upon it. But these angels, now then, let's see what their sin was. Alright? He gives us the illustration of that which was true for Sodom and Gomorrah. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them 
who in like fashion to these? Who in like fashion to these committed fornication and went after different flesh? And these cities are reserved as an example, if you please, suffering eternal judgment, fiery eternal judgment. They're set forth an example. Now then, this particular rendering you will observe in your English Bible. And I'll ask you to make a nota notation of this in verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, put a little comma there, will you? Put a little comma there. In like manner to these. This little word, two toys. An immediate demonstrative pronoun is in the masculine gender. In ma the masculine gender. Now then, the antecedent to that demonstrative pronoun is not the plural word cities. The cities is feminine in gender. You cannot take a masculine and make that modify a feminine noun. Absolutely not. That's like me. If I were to make this kind of an illustration, well, Ken drove up from Massey to attend Bible school. She did a great thing, didn't she? <laughs> no. Isn't that ridiculous? Ken is a man. And so if I take a personal pronoun, and this happens to be a demonstrative, but the genders work the same, and I refer to a man as she, of course, that is a flagrant violation of grammar. Not only English, but when you come to the Greek, it's absolute. The little word tutois, the closest antecedent to which it refers, is the angelus, the angelus, the plural of angelos, masculine, which is translated, properly so, as angel, angel. So you see, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was a sin that was similar to the sin of the angels that kept not their job in the heavenlies and did not keep their home in the heavenlies, but came to the earth and cohabited with the daughters of men. This is one of the reasons why there was such a godless, godless situation up on the face of the earth back in the Old Testament times, such a deplorable situation that when God looked upon the face of the earth, he said, it repented him that he made bond. But there was a gleam of light, Noah, on his family. Only Noah and his family were spared. But it was so wicked, absolutely so wicked, that God absolutely could not and did not and would not spare that particular situation on the earth. So he brought a great flood, the Noahic flood. Destroyed that wickedness, absolutely so. But what introduced it? It wasn't the breakdown between the godly lines and the ungodly line of humanity. It was a breakdown between that and the heavenlies with that upon the earth. And I'll tell you, Satan did his very best to corrupt the entire world, and he just about got the job done. But he used a group of his godless cohorts in the heavenlies to do it. And men submitted their selves to that unholy conduct. Lot, offering, if you please, his daughters. I, I, I'll tell you, that was, a, that was a later date, but that's a, what we have with reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. No, Jude, verse 6 and 7. 
Jude, verse 6 and 7, verifies, verifies the Old Testament account that angels committed this crime. Now, there's a, there's a little bit of a problem here that I'd like to uh, help you with. It says, went after different flesh. That's heteros flesh. That, that's different. It wasn't the fact that they cohabited, if you please, in Sodom and Gomorrah uh, with illicit uh, relations of the inhabitants there. Uh, they did that, of course. <clears throat> but they cohabited with beastly flesh, too. Now, here is, here is a, a reference. I've got four of them, if you please. I'd like for you to take down your notes. The law that God gave to Israel the law that God gave to Israel with reference to the prohibition of cohabiting with beastly flesh. Now, if it were not for some of these explicit things mentioned, we might argue. But God comes along and gives to his children, if you please, a law prohibiting this matter of intimate relations with beastly flesh as repugnant as that may seem and is to us. It shows you how low humanity can stoop. And uh, it's going on today, too. I could give you some illustrations of something that's taking place right in our city. But I don't think it's appropriate. But here are some references that God has given concerning the prohibition against such conduct for his people. I right, take this down. Exodus 22, verse 19. Now, as a result, death. Now Leviticus 18.23, spoken of as defiling. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 15, death resulting. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 16, resulting in death. Now that's God's opinion as to how awful such relationship is. Death. And those that will defile themselves. What do we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Behold, your body is a temple of God. And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God what? Destroy. The angels. They went after different flesh. Different than that which was provided for them as fleshly beings that could cohabit, that could carry on conduct. But what did they do? They took the daughters of men and raised up, if you please, a terrible, terrible posterity. God had to destroy it, and he did destroy it with the great Noahic flood. All right, there's Jude verse 6 and 7, which verifies for us that a group of angels did do this godless thing. Now then, I want you to turn with me where we have a little more elaboration upon this particular uh, diagram, and that's the reason we're taking quite a little bit of time uh, to explain this, because we feel as though in dealing with things under the earth that here is one facet of the economy of God and His holiness that we must have clear because it affects, not only affected the past, but it's going to affect the future. Now then, in Second Peter chapter 2, we have another very, very important passage in this connection. In Second Peter chapter 2, let me begin reading with verse 1, and I want to read down through uh, verse 7 or 8. You follow along. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if, this is the first class conditional sentence, to, incidentally, for since God spared not the angels that sinned, 
but cast them down to hell. Notice the chart. Cast them down to Tartarus is the Greek word. The only occurrence, the only occurrence of that Greek word in the New Testament. Now, this has been overlooked, slighted, explained away. But the Bible says it. And our English word, H-E-L-L, -L, in this passage is that which is a translation for that Greek word. The only, only occurrence in the Greek New Testament. All right. He cast them down into Tartarus and delivered them into what? Into chains of darkness. That's the reason we got the illustration here. Chains of darkness to be reserved. To be reserved unto when? Unto judgment. Now listen. At the Noahic flood, they were cast down here. Boy, they, they were put in prison. They're on death row. But their judgment is to take place at the great white throne judgment, which we will deal with in our survey of prophecy later on. But it's explicitly stated that the angels, the angels had left their job, left their home, took, took upon themselves a godless conduct with the daughters of men and so forth. He has delivered them into this particular place. Now notice what the Bible has to say in its context in connection with this as a great warning that we today are not to give heed to false prophets and etc. And he spared not the old world. What was that? Just what we've mentioned? in connection with this matter of the angels that he's cast down. He spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Oh, don't you see? There are those, there are those people that feel as though the flood is sort of a little local thing there in the Mesopotamia Valley. But I want to tell you something. God looked upon the earth and repented him that he had made man. He said, I'll destroy man. He did almost that. Save Noah. Why? Because of this godless conduct that ensued. Now then, he gives us another illustration of like sin and conduct and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Isis condemned them with an overflow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Would to God people would take heed to the examples of the holiness of God. Now listen. This whole world's not going to get away with it. You better preach it. It's a hard thing to preach the holiness and the judgment of God. But God says, listen, this has been done and it has been recorded in the New Testament, verifying what he took place in the Old Testament for an example of his holy judgment upon all who live ungodly. Yes, the sin of Genesis chapter 6. The angels, the angels that brought about such a terrible, terrible thing. A group, now I want you, I want you to, uh, to understand that. The angels of sin, that particular group. Not all of the angels, but that, uh, those, that group of angels called the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6. It's that, that group of angels we're talking about. So, dear folks, please observe that that which God created, Satan endeavoring to thwart, just like the Lord said in 3.15, Yes, you bruise his heel, but he'll bruise your head. There was a great bruising, 
This is one of the first great world bruisings. But you'll notice who was victorious. God was victorious. But those angels, those angels that sinned, reserved under chains of darkness and to Tartarus, tar they are reserved unto the great day of judgment, whether be judged. And as we read in Matthew chapter 25, as he speaks to those goats of the Gentile nations, depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So we find their final doom is here in the eternal Gehenna hellfire. They are reserved. They are kept for that terrible, terrible, eternal, agonizing execution day. The great white throne judgment. It deals with the plan and the program of God. Things in the heavens, things upon the earth, and things under the earth. But I want to say this. We have a Bible. And when you study the plan and the program of God, and you see how he's dealt with wickedness, and he's given these things explicitly stated as example of his holiness. It should behoove you, it should behoove me to be willing to spend and be spent to reach a world whose minds are blinded by Satan. So that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ cannot shine under them. Prophecy must lead us to Him, must affect our heart to such an extent that it'll cause our feet to walk in light of thus saith the Lord. For our next class, we will take up another facet, very, very important facet of prophecy. And that will be God's program beginning with Israel. And it is at that particular juncture where we have the vast majority of God's revelation given over to his great dealing upon earth with mankind. So again, we want to give you the assignment. Review, if you will, the great Abrahamic covenant. It is one of the major foundation stones to a proper understanding of the great plan and program of God. For our class today, we're ready for Roman numeral number two in our survey of biblical prophecy. And this division is entitled God's Program Beginning with Israel. And we gave you an assignment last time to survey the Abrahamic covenant. And for our class, we will deal with that particular covenant in this session. Dr. Ryrie, in his book, the Basic Theology book, has this to say with reference to the Abrahamic Covenant. It is this covenant which is the watershed between premillennialism and amillennialism. Now, we cannot state any greater thing with reference to prophecy than this is basic. This is basic to an understanding of prophecy. 
if one could have the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant down, and hold to these covenants literally as the Word of God teaches, then his eschatology would be straight. One would be forever clear. You would be safe. You would be satisfied. You would have an absolute clear conscience with reference to the biblical plan of God. This is a covenant of extreme importance. And I'd like to recommend for you, since I've just mentioned, I'd like to recommend uh, for you uh, a couple of books that I believe that you will find profitable in your study of the Abrahamic covenant, which goes into some detail. Now, the first book that deals with the Abrahamic covenant uh, in some detail and uh, rather exhaustively would be Dr. Walvoord's book entitled The Millennial Kingdom. The Millennial Kingdom by Dr. John F. Walvoord. Now, if you want a uh, concise, uh, short uh, presentation of the covenants, we suggest for you this basic theology book of Dr. Ryrie. And uh, I'm sure that you will find these textbooks of real benefit as you study some of these very, very important facets of biblical uh, eschatology. Now for the Abrahamic covenant, there are four things that we'd simply like to bring to your attention concerning the covenant as to our survey of biblical prophecy. I'd like for you to take your Bibles now and turn with me to the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. Now the four facets of study will be the character of the covenant, the content of the covenant, the confirmation of the covenant, and the certainty of the covenant. There are four headings that I believe will uh, serve our purpose well in our survey of biblical prophecy. Now in Genesis chapter 12, the first thing that I want to share with you is the character of the Abrahamic covenant. Now this will also be true of the Davidic covenant and also the new covenant. Now, again, we've stated these covenants are extremely important and basic to a proper understanding of the field of eschatology or biblical prophecy. Now, maybe I ought to sort of clarify ourselves when I, when I emphasize and give such stress to the covenants because some say, well, that's such a dry thing to study. Listen, the covenants made back here with Abraham David, and then the New Covenant, they find their fulfillment in the future with reference to the great millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the reason Dr. Ryrie states the Abrahamic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, primarily the Abrahamic Covenant, is the watershed between the premillennialist and the amillennialist. As you know, amillennialism Amillennialism is just simply that uh, negation of the millennium. They deny the fact that there is to be a millennium. So if you have the Abrahamic covenant down and the Davidic covenant, you will come out all right in the future of biblical study. Now, if you're an amillennialist, of course, uh, this will uh, not be of uh, importance to you, nor will the literal interpretation of your Bible when it deals with the second coming of the Lord and all the future aspects of the Lord, will that be of uh, any importance? I should not make such a generalized statement as that, but all of the future activities of the Lord are desperately colored and in some cases just simply negated when you hold to the amillennial position. But now let's look at the character of the covenant. And right at the outset, we would like to make this statement. The character of the covenant is what we call unconditional. Unconditional aspect of the Abrahamic covenant is of great importance. And what do we mean by the unconditional character of the covenant? It is just simply this. It's a covenant where you have God saying, I will do something. In other words, this is the total volition of God 
Now for the blessing received of the covenant, then of course that depends upon obedience as far as the people to whom this covenant is given. But I want, you, I want to point out these great aspects of the unconditional character of the covenant. Please observe, if you will, verses 1 and 2 of Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will bless them that bless thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now you notice that I've skipped a few things here. But the emphasis that I want you to see is the word of the Lord declaring to Abraham, I will do this, and I will do that. All right, now then, let's continue where you have some uh, areas of understanding as to the Abrahamic covenant concerning these uh, unconditional statements. Turn with me to the 13th chapter, and let us observe verse 15, 16, and 17. Notice these words. In verse 15, to thee will I give it. Verse 16, I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. Now the last part of verse 7, for I will give it unto thee. Again, the great I wills. Now there are similar, similar statements of intent by God, uh, not necessarily stating I will, but uh, with other uh, uh, types of expression. And we'll probably come along across some of them in just a few moments. Now then, in fact, in Genesis chapter 15, 5, you find a very similar uh, declaration, but not exactly the same words, I will. Notice in Genesis 15, verse 5, where he states to Abraham, So shall thy seed be. Now then, in verse 18, we read this. Unto thy seed have I given this land. Now, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 2, we again notice some real uh, dogmatic declarations from God. Verse 2, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And in the last part of verse 5, uh, uh, for a father, you shall be a father of many nations. Have I, I have made thee so. That is, in changing Abram's name to Abraham. Now, in verse 6, And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee. I will establish my covenant, and I will give unto thee, and etc. You can notice in the 17th chapter a number of great I wills. Now this is what we call the unconditional character of the covenant. So <clears throat> when it comes to the establishment of the covenant, when it comes to the matter of the fulfillment of the covenant, when it comes to the matter of the outworking of the covenant, God states this is a covenant that is totally dependent upon the integrity of my word. I will do this. Again now, when it comes to the matter of receiving the blessings of this declaration from heaven, that is dependent, not, I don't like to use the term condition because people get the wrong idea, but it is uh, that which is a declaration from God and blessing is on the basis of a spiritual platform when it comes to the matter of realizing the blessing of God. Now, let me give you an illustration. <clears throat> when it comes to the matter of our salvation, God gives to us, dogmatically declared throughout the Scriptures and verified in a number of places, that He will give to us eternal life. Now, our salvation is an eternal salvation. Now, that is totally dependent upon the grace of God, the provision of God, the work of God. Now then, in order for you and in order for me to enjoy the blessing of our salvation, it is dependent upon our walk. Being in that 
frame, if you please, of a spiritual walk in a relationship to our Lord, it is that which will result in great blessing of our salvation. Now, if a person says he's saved, and he is saved for all practical purposes, as far as the testimony is concerned, and he walks in rebellion to God, is he going to lose that salvation? No, he's not. But I'm going to tell you something. God never intended, and you cannot find in the Word of God, where God condones such a thing or supports such a thing. When you're saved, you're supposed to walk in sweet fellowship with Him. Now, if I don't walk in sweet fellowship with Him, the salvation, the salvation is not in danger, but I'll tell you, the great fellowship is in danger, and also the rewards later on. It's going to be a very, very uh, 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 desolate time in the presence of the Lord for a believer if he does not walk in the framework of fellowship of that great, glorious salvation that God has provided for him through the person of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, and that is similar, if you please, to the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. Now then, let's notice some of these things. Turn with me back, if you please, to the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. And here you find that a, God declares, if you please, a platform for spiritual blessing. In verse 1, now God has said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. You see, in order for him to receive the blessing of a sovereign declaration, it involved separation. Abraham was to be separated from his family, back there in Ur of the Colonies, and separated from his homeland. So on the basis of a separation from the family and from the homeland, on that basis would it be the blessing that Abraham was promised through the sovereign, unconditional declaration of the covenant. So blessing is on the basis of separation for him. Now then, please notice the 13th chapter and verse 14. <clears throat> and in this 13th chapter of the book of Genesis, you know, the herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham have had uh, a strife. And so Abraham proposes to Lot, let there not be a strife uh, among our herdsmen. Uh, you choose where you want to live, and I'll take the other place. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he looked down there at the well-watered plains where Sodom was. And so, so Abraham chose to go to Sodom, and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And uh, my, what a, what a pitiful, pitiful choice this was for him. But Abram, I find, he went to Canaan. And in verse uh, 14, we read these, uh, uh, read, read these words. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated. Now notice, when did the word of the Lord come to Abram again? After there was separation. Separation from Lot. Lot represents for us, if you please, gross, gross carnality. He chose, he chose to live in a despicable place. It was beautiful, but all the character of it, on the basis of separation, of strife, and the sense of values of Lot, after with the, after the separation, then God spoke. God gave further elaboration and blessing as far as his covenant to Abraham. Now then, I'd like for you to turn to chapter 15, verse 1, and notice another great spiritual platform which uh, Abraham chose, and it resulted in further blessing. 14th chapter, you have Lot, uh, Abraham, returning with Lot after the slaughter of the kings. And let me read verse 21 of the 14th chapter. And the king of, Od uh, king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram said unto the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, 
that I will not take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich, or Abram rich. And then, what do we have in verse, uh, verse 1 of 15th chapter? After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham. You see, when Abram made a separation from the provision of the world, the riches of the world, materialism, Abram said, absolutely not. I will not be enriched by the world. And as a result, as a result, you have the Lord unveiling his word again to Abraham regarding his great, great promise. Now then, turn with me to the 16th and 17th chapter of the book of Genesis, and let's notice another facet or stage of the great spiritual platform of blessing for Abraham. Now in the 16th verse of the 16th chapter, you have these words, and Abraham was fourscore and six, six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Now who was Hagar? Hagar was the Egyptian. And Ishmael uh, was born uh, from Hagar through the relationship that Abraham had with her. Here they're trying to run ahead against the, uh, run ahead of the Lord. And so here is the fruit of the flesh. Bond lady, or the lady that came out of Egypt uh, with them. And uh, if you please, what do we have in the first verse of the 17th chapter? And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram. There are 13 silent years, 13 silent years between the birth of Ishmael and the presence of the Lord with Abram again, as far as the record is concerned. What's Abraham doing? Well, it has been suggested, and I think it's probably right. Here you have Abraham occupied with the fruit of the flesh out of Egypt. Now, there's nothing wrong to be occupied with your family, and you must be. But this was not the promise seed. Ishmael was not the promise seed, absolutely not. And so, from this point on, you have God appearing to Abram. And there's a great, great account of the Lord speaking to Abraham after his separation from the flesh here. Well, we, uh, we trust that the great character of the Abrahamic covenant will be indelibly imprinted in your mind. It's an unconditional declaration from God to Abraham. But Abraham, if you're going to enjoy the blessing of it, of what I've uh, uh, unconditionally declared to you, listen, it demands some separation. For you to enjoy again the blessing of your salvation in Christ, I'm going to tell you something. You've got to be one that will live a life of spiritual fellowship with your Lord. You've got to be separated from carnality. You've got to be separated from that which will stand in the place that's going to break your fellowship with the Lord. Suppose it be family or suppose it be country. Was it be land? Many a young person, many a young person has been set on the shelf because they've refused to follow the leading of the Lord. I was pastor of a man in his sunset years that made a terrible confession to me. I was sitting in his front room with him while my wife and his wife were fixing the meal for us that evening. And he said, I have something on my heart. 
when I was in Bible school, we had a missionary conference. The Lord spoke to me and placed on my heart such a conviction that I was to go to the mission field. And he went up to Helen afterwards. He was all enthused. He was thrilled with the leading of the Lord. He said, Helen, God has called me to the mission field. And after we get married, my, we can go as a team. And Helen looked at him, and she stuck out that finger with that diamond ring and said this to him, Arnold, choose. Choose me or the mission field. Arnold chose her. And from a young man to the age where he was about to slip out to meet his Lord, he had carried that heart of rejection. Choose him, if you please, not to leave his girlfriend, but to leave the call of the Lord. Listen, you live a life of regrets if you do not, do not yield to the Lord in a life of fellowship. Don't let anything, don't let family, home, money, flesh, carnality, don't let that come in between. Oh, listen, Arnold was a good saved man. And he loved to talk about the Lord, and loved to talk about the Word, loved to listen to me minister. But he still knew that he was not in the place of full blessing in light of the provision that God had made for him. Abram, Abram made the choice. Now, he had lots of failures too, but he got some things straightened up. Now then listen, the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant was a sovereign declaration of God, what God is going to do. The place of blessing depended upon a spiritual response from Abraham. Now then, let's pass on to the content of the great Abrahamic covenant. Let's go back to the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. Now the basic content of the Abrahamic covenant is revealed for us in verse 2 and 3 of the 12th chapter. And God has stated this, I will make of thee a great nation. That involves a people, isn't that right? Absolutely so. I'll bless thee, and I'll make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I'll bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now listen. Two great things we must always remember when it comes to this covenant. And God had promised sovereignly that from Abraham there would be a great nation, a great people. And secondly, that from Abraham, from his posterity, or his posterity, there would be a blessing to all of the nations. Don't forget that. Not only was he going to have a great nation coming from him, but from him there would be a seed that would be a blessing to not only the nation Israel, but to all nations. Now there are some very definite principles we've got to remember concerning this covenant. And one is this, that whosoever will bless thee, I'll bless them. Whosoever will curse thee, I'll curse him. Now then, that that particular stipulation of the Abrahamic covenant is still in vogue, is still valid, absolutely so. Now, you and I do not have to like the conduct of the Jewish people any more than we like the conduct of the terrorists. But when it comes to the matter of an ethnic, ethnic hate, you be careful. 
History has proven the validity of the Abrahamic Covenant right down to this day. World War II, we saw how terrible the Jew was treated by the Nazis. What happened to them? God took them off the scene, isn't that right? Now there were a great number of the Jews that had to suffer, but the Jew still remains. You be careful. You be careful with reference to opposition against the Jew because he's a Jew. Again, you don't have to like the sin of the Jew any more than you like the sin of the Gentile. But don't you ever, don't you ever get involved in the matter of racial hatred when it comes to the matter of the Jew. Now then, please observe, if you will, that you have not only a national blessing, but you have the universal blessing, and these blessings are enlarged, if you please, in these particular references. In Genesis 13, verses 15 through 17, we've looked at them very briefly with reference to the unconditional character. Now then, notice some things mentioned here. For all of the land, for all of the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, and he states, ask Abraham, get up and walk through the land. And he says, I will give it unto thee. Now here is an enlargement with reference to the basic uh, covenant mentioned in the 12th chapter. There was a great nation. All right. That nation is going to have a homeland. A land, if you please. And so now the Abrahamic covenant involves a great nation, a great land, a great seed, and a blessing to all of the world. Now then, you have this elaborated, if you please, in the 15th chapter, verses 5 through 8, and then verse 18. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. And he says, If you can number them, so shall thy seed be. And then we uh, come to verse 8, and he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit this land? And Abraham, now, Lord, I, I want some proof. And so the Lord gives him some instruction. And there's a great sacrifice made here, and God meets him in that sacrifice. And at the end, in verse 18 of the revelation concerning that sacrifice, you read these words. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now there are the boundaries for the great land. Now then, I'm not sure if you're acquainted with your geography uh, in, to such a degree that you can follow along, but, uh, uh, you know, the great Euphrates is that river that heads up in the Eret, rain, Eret Mountain Range uh, above what we'd have uh, today as Syria. Now, there's quite a debate with reference to the river of Egypt. Some say it is that small river that takes place down there in the Gaza Strip uh, or is found down there in the Gaza Strip and others state that it's the great Nile River. Now, uh, irrespective of what our understanding may be, you can understand that there is a great, great land that God has promised to Israel as their homeland. And uh, I, I would just like to uh, state this for you, that this is a promise concerning a people, a nation, a land, a posterity, and a blessing, and that this promise is not only unconditional, but it's eternal promise. Now, we've already read some of these things, but in the 17th chapter, you have uh, this terrifically uh, revealed for us and dogmatically declared, if you please. Beginning with verse 2, And I'll make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many, many nations. Neither shall my, thy name uh, any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. Why Abraham? Well, here's the interpretation for it. For a father of many nations have I made thee. That's the reason Abram, his name was changed to Abraham because he was to be the originator of many, many people. Now then, let's notice verse 6 through 8. 
And I'll make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I'll establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Here some time ago, when Menachem Begin was the leader of Israel, he, uh, along with Sadat and President Carter, signed the uh, accord uh, there, and uh, I I'll never forget that. You had Menachem Begin, Sadat, and Mr. Carter, and all three of them holding hands, and that Camp David Accord was signed, supposed to be an eternal peace, if you please, between Israel and Egypt. Well, soon after that, there was a cartoon that came out in our local paper. It showed Menachem Begin on top of a large rock. And it wasn't down in Egypt, but there was a title on these rocks called the Golan Heights. And in the left hand, he had a staff with the Star of David as the flag right there on the top of that rock. And all around him was great big streaks of lightning just coming down. And um, underneath the caption, uh, uh, underneath the uh, picture was the caption with Menachem Begin standing there with a flag in one hand on the Golan Heights and the Bible in the other hand and it read this. This says it's our homeland. <laughs> what do you have reference to? He had reference to the covenant made to Abraham right back here in the early chapters of the book of Genesis. And when Menachem Begin was interviewed with reference to that event, whether he would uh, carry on diplomatic relations with Arafat or, or not, I simply stated, they want to discuss whether we have a right to, a ho to our homeland. And sat back in his chair, and I'll never forget that, as I watched on uh, the news, and he just waved with his hand and said this. That right was given to us 4,000 years ago. What do you have reference to? 2,000 years for the church age, 2,000 years back to the time of Abraham. Menachem Begin, the state of Israel, lays claim to a homeland by virtue of biblical title deed. They know that. They hold to that. We better believe it. Because it's declared right here in our Bible, the content of the Abrahamic covenant is there going to be a great nation. There's going to be a homeland. And because of the Jew, there's going to be blessing to all the nations of the earth. Listen, folks. The Abrahamic covenant is foundation to understand God's dealing with man upon the face of this earth. And if we do not properly understand the great promise of that unconditional covenant, again, we're going to be at sea when it comes to the matter of understanding the biblical revelation of the program of God. Now then, let's just simply notice some of the confirmations with reference to the great Abrahamic covenant. Now, um, uh, we don't need to spend a great deal of time on this, but just because it is mentioned here in verse 7, I think it is well for us to note that this covenant was not only made to Abraham, but as God states in verse 7, these words that there would be confirmation later on, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, and will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land, and etc. Now you see this Abrahamic covenant is not over an everlasting covenant, which ought to settle the issue. Isn't that right? But 
He says, listen, I'm not only going to tell you about it, but I'm going to confirm this covenant, if you please, with your posterity. All right, let's just see if the Bible holds, this, holds true to this. And turn with me to Genesis chapter 26, verse 3, where you have the confirmation of this covenant given to Isaac. Here, Isaac is the son of Abraham, and we read these words in 26.3. Speaking to Isaac, he said, Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee, for unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father, and etc., right on down through verse 4 and 5. So you see, to the seed, Isaac, here is the confirmation of the Abrahamic covenant declared in the 26th chapter. Now turn with me to the 28th chapter, verse 12 and 14. 12 through 14, we read these words with reference to Jacob, the son of Isaac, one of them. And notice how it is confirmed, established with Jacob. And Jacob dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascended and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest. To thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. It's practically the same thing that you read with reference to the words given to Abraham. So you see, and we could uh, go on with a number of other references, but listen, that is sufficient. Just to point out to you how that the covenant is unconditional. The covenant declares a great promise to Abraham as to a nation, a, a land, and a blessing coming from them to all of the nations. And it is confirmed unto his seed and unto his posterity. So we've got a great promise that is absolute and is sure. Now then, let's just notice another wonderful aspect with reference to the Abrahamic covenant uh, in light of it being an everlasting covenant. And this time, let's notice the certainty of the covenant in light of some of the New Testament passages of Scripture, which I think will be of an encouragement to you as a class. All right, now, first of all, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, if you please. The first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And let's read uh, that first verse. And we'll point out something that uh, we want you to remember. Now, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Don't forget this, please. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. I just... We're going to give you some news with reference to the Lord Jesus Christ concerning his beginning in light of his incarnation. He's called the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of Abraham. Now then, throughout the Gospel of Matthew, this twofold characteristic of the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ will unfold the Gospel of Matthew. Now we're going to be dealing with the Davidic Covenant in our next lesson. But the Davidic Covenant relates to the fact that Israel is to have a king and a kingdom and so forth. All right, now then, the Abrahamic Covenant that we've been dealing with guarantees there's to be a posterity. Guarantees that that posterity is to have a homeland guarantees that from the posterity of Abraham there'd be one who would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Where do we live? We live in the church age, isn't that right? We are not Jews, but in light of the book of Galatians and elsewhere, we are a spiritual seed of Abraham. A spiritual seed not from the standpoint of an ethnic relation, 
but a spiritual seed because Abraham is called the father of faith. And since he's called the father of faith and we are children of faith, therefore we are a spiritual seed of Abraham, but not a physical seed to inherit the physical blessings of the seed of Abraham. Now there's also a physical seed of Abraham that's going to be purged away. But there's also a physical seed of Abraham who have a spiritual relationship that's right with God during the tribulation period that's going to enter in to the great blessing of the millennial reign. And that is to whom the covenant is guaranteed. But notice if you please, that covenant is guaranteed fulfillment because of a particular seed, the seed of Jesus Christ. Now turn with me to Galatians chapter 3, and let's notice some of this, shall we? Galatians chapter 3, with reference to the blessing of Abraham. Now, when you come to verse 13, he's emphasizing the reason why there's blessing to the Gentiles. Let me begin reading with verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. What kind of blessing? Not the blessing as a land. Not the blessing as a nation per se. Although there's going to be great blessing for the Gentile concerning the land later on. But that we should receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see, he's talking about spiritual blessing. Not the blessing of a homeland, not the blessing, if you please, of a nation of people, no, but a spiritual blessing. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and of seeds as, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So the blessing. The blessing upon the earth with reference to the literal fulfillment as well as the spiritual blessings comes through the one seed, Jesus Christ. Now because Christ came on the seed, we're guaranteed the absolute fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And all the wonderful things that's going to happen and we're going to get to them in our sur survey of prophecy with the coming of the Lord Jesus and how it affects the Jew. And how it affects the Gentile. All right, now then, let's also notice in Acts chapter 1, uh, verse uh, 6 and 7. Turn there to, the first, uh, to Acts chapter 1, the first chapter, if you please. And uh, we'll notice some words here that we ought to understand. Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 6 uh, and 7. Now, the Lord Jesus has been crucified... He's been raised from the grave. He's walked for 40 days upon the face of the earth, ministering uh, concerning, things, uh, concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And just before he goes back to the heavenlies, now he has these words. Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. When they, those that were with him, there, uh, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, this primarily relates to the Davidic covenant. But in order for the kingdom to be a reality, it had to have a homeland. Now, please observe, if you will, the answer of the Lord in verse 7. And he saith unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He does not deny, does he, that there will not be a kingdom. Oh, absolutely not. He simply states, listen, with reference to the great, great fulfillment of the promise whereby there will be a kingdom upon the face of the earth. See, they felt as though all of their promises had been null and void because they recognized in Christ, their great Messiah, that since he was crucified, well, their hopes were dashed. But then, when, he, when they saw him alive, Oh, then their anticipation was, oh, uh, what about the blessings that God made with Abraham and David back in the Old Testament? Are you now 
Are you now going to fulfill these wonderful blessings for us? Will you do that now? Listen, that's in the Father's hands. But I've got a job for you to do now. God has a new program, the church. Now ye shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, under the uttermost parts of the earth. Not just to the Jewish nation, but to all of the nations of the world, the Gentiles, if you please. You see, there was to be the spiritual blessing. For in thee, Abraham, in thy seed, there shall be a blessing to all nations. Aren't you thankful for that? I am. Now then, listen, let's turn again to another wonderful portion of Scripture, and that is to be found in Romans chapter 11. The 11th chapter of the book of Romans, in dealing with this matter of blessing from the Lord, and particularly at this juncture, in light of Israel. In Romans chapter 11, beginning with verse 25, we'll read these words. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, he's speaking about this particular age, and you will see the title, The Fullness of the Gentiles, of the church. Now, he says, uh, blindness in part has happened to the Jew until the fullness of the Gentiles is completed. Now then, please notice, if you will, what's going to happen in verse 26. It does not have the time element, but the context tells us that there's going to be a time of the fullness of the Jew. But in verse 26, we read, read this, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant of them, when I shall take away their sins. Now then, this covenant specifically, the... Uh, new covenant. But, and we'll deal with that later on, but a new covenant that relates to Israel, who received promises, if you please, from Abraham, and the promise of blessing for the Jew is totally dependent upon, if you please, the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And it says, all Israel shall be saved or delivered. Now I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me back in the Old Testament to the 20th chapter, if you please, of the chapter, uh, 20th chapter of the book of Ezekiel. And here you have promise that is going to be fulfilled with reference to the second advent of the Lord Jesus. Now in the 20th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, I want to begin reading the verse 33, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out will I rule over you and will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels and them that transgress against me. I will bring you forth out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Go ye serve ye every one his idols, and hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. For in mine holy mountain is the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God. There shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There will I accept them, and there will I require your offerings and the first fruits of your oblations with all your holy things. I will accept you with your sweet Savior when I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries where ye, wherein ye have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen, and ye shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. Now here's a great promise that relates to the activities when the Lord Jesus Christ returns from heaven. God is going to gather 
all of the Jews together, and he's going to purge out the rebel. This is also found in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. He's going to purge out all of the rebel Jews, and the blessed Jew that has endured through the tribulation time is going to enter in. You see, and so all Israel shall be saved. Notice, if you please, the 39th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, where we read such dogmatic statements from the uh, pan of inspiration, if you please, that just cannot be gainsaid. Beginning with verse 25, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, now will, I bring you ag uh, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob, and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel, and will be jealous for my holy name. After that they have borne their shame in all their trespasses, whereby they have trespassed against me, when they dwelt safely in their land, and none made them afraid. When I brought them again from the people, and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and am sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land, and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face, and etc. Listen, folks. Today, the Jew has a homeland. The Jew in that homeland in the tribulation time is going to be kicked out. That is Revelation chapter 12. That's absolutely so. The Antichrist is going to just kick them right out. The man of sin, the lawless one. And the, they're going to have to flee for their life. And it says the earth is going to open its mouth and uh, uh, protect them. And there's going to be a place prepared of God uh, to care for them for the th last three and a half years. But then the Lord is going to return. And all the Jews from all over, it says here, not a one shall be left. No, sir, not a Jew left. But they're going to be brought into the bonds of the covenant. Those that are not spiritually right with the Lord at the second advent of Christ, he's going to purge them out. They're going to be killed. But those that are spiritually right with the Lord, they're going to enter into the great, great millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have to because it was promised back here in the Abrahamic covenant that they would have a homeland. You see this red line indicates the Jew. All right, here the Gentiles are in supremacy over them and the Gentiles will be in that place of supremacy because of God's chastening hand upon the Jew until the end of the times of the Gentiles and the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to bring them in to the great blessings of these wonderful promises made back in the Old Testament. Yes, the Abrahamic covenant is foundational for a proper understanding of the great plan and the program of God and the activities which are going to take place in the future centering around that great person of the Lord Jesus Christ who is of the seed of Abraham to fulfill the great Abrahamic covenant. Isn't that marvelous? Dear people, in the meantime, hold fast to the blessing of your salvation. Enjoy the great provision. And as we continue to study prophecy, we're going to so, uh, be so thoroughly thrilled to be led more and more into the blessedness of the focal person of prophecy, the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a great Savior, a great program of God that the Abrahamic covenant is so foundational to understanding the full program of God. Well, class, the Lord bless you. Now we'd just like to assign for you the matter of the Davidic covenant. You take the Bible, the Old Testament, particularly 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I want you to study out, if you please, the Davidic covenant, which is our assignment for our next lesson. So, again, good night, and the Lord bless you.